Hello everyone, I hope you're all doing okay. In this video, we'll be talking about the fifth cranial nerve or the trigeminal nerve. As part of this lesson, we'll talk about the pathway of the trigeminal nerve. Next, we'll learn about the nuclei, which give off different neurons that contribute to the trigeminal nerve and its three branches. Then we'll talk about the structures which are innervated by this nerve. Then we will talk about the functions of the cranial nerve nuclei that contribute to the formation of the trigeminal nerve. By doing so, we will understand the function of the trigeminal nerve as a whole. Lastly, we'll apply this information clinically to understand the clinical deficits associated with the lesions of the trigeminal nerve. Now, prior to listening to my video on the cranial nerves, I would highly recommend that if you haven't done it so far, then please first listen to my seminal lecture on the brainstem and the cranial nerve nuclei, which will provide you with a solid foundation to build further on your knowledge of the cranial nerves. The link for the lecture is provided below in the comment section. Now, while describing each cranial nerve in this lecture and in the subsequent ones, I'll be using this table as a reference point to find out which cranial nerve nuclei contribute to the formation of which specific cranial nerves. And then we will build upon our description of each cranial nerve from over there. And also I'll be using this picture as a reference point, which is nothing but a pictorial representation of the same table which we have just talked about over here. What the picture shows is uh, a view of the back of the brainstem. You can also you can also see the two thalami resting on top of the brainstem. This is a posterior view of the midbrain, which is characterized by these lobulated swellings at the back of the midbrain. These are the two superior colliculi concerned with vision, and these are the two inferior colliculi concerned with the hearing mechanism. Then you can see the diamond-shaped fourth ventricle over here, and the reason why you can actually see it clearly is because the cerebellum, which was supposed to form the roof of the fourth ventricle, has been taken off. And now you can see the floor of fourth ventricle here. The floor of the fourth ventricle is formed partly by the pons, so this region belongs to the pons, and it is partly formed by the medulla, so this is the medulla down below over here. Then you can see the cranial nerve nuclei which have been overlaid on the brainstem. These cranial nerve nuclei have been color coded to match the colors of the columns in the table over here. So the motor columns have been shown in red, yellow, and orange, and they correspond with the red, yellow, orange colors uh, of the columns in the table over here. The sensory columns have been color coded as blue, purple, and green, and they correspond with the blue, purple, and green columns in the table here. Now, as a first step, let's see where does the trigeminal nerve originates from, from the base of the brain. Now, on the left over here, you can see an illustration of the base of the brain showing the ventral aspect of the pons right over here. You can see the area where the basilar groove is going to be present. That's where the basilar artery as part of the vertebral basilar circulation that is going to run over here. And then you can see the transverse pontocerebellar fibers running laterally, passing through the cerebellar peduncle, the middle cerebellar peduncle on the right and on the left. And this peduncle, through that peduncle, the fibers are then going to enter into the cerebellum. The trigeminal nerve can be seen originating from the ventral surface of the pons over here on the right side here and on the left side over here. On the right, you can see a similar view of the prosection of the base of the brain with the pons clearly visible here. And you can see the basilar artery running on the basilar groove in front of the pons. And then you can see the medulla oblongata down below clearly visible. Uh, the midbrain is not that clearly visible because it is obscured by these vessels over here. You can probably appreciate the transverse pontocerebellar fibers or their transverse texture over here. The, uh, these are going to enter through the peduncle, uh, through the middle cerebellar peduncle into the cerebellum. On the ventral surface of the pons, on the right, you can see the trigeminal nerve here. And you can see the trigeminal nerve on the left side here as well. Probably not that clearly visible, uh, just like its counterpart on the right side. Following the origin from the ventral pons at the base of the brain, the trigeminal nerve then runs anteriorly to reach the face region. Now what you can see here is an illustration of the cranial cavity. You can see the vault of the skull has been removed and you can see the cranial cavity consequently. Brain stem will be residing against the bony clivus over here, which is this region, which is formed by the basilar part of occipital bone and the body of the sphenoid bone. The trigeminal nerve, once it exits from the ventral surface of the pons, it splits up into its three branches. These are the ophthalmic division, the maxillary division, and the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve. 
The branches then exit through their respective foramina inside the cranial cavity to become extracranial. For instance, the ophthalmic or the V1 division of trigeminal nerve that, that is going to pass through this slit-like space over here between the lesser ring of sphenoid bone at the top and the greater ring of sphenoid bone down below. That slit-like space is called superior orbital fissure. You can't really see it clearly here because the fissure is covered over by the lesser ring of sphenoid bone. But if you look at it from an angle from the back, you will be able to see the fissure very clearly. The ophthalmic or the V1 division of trigeminal nerve passes through the superior orbital fissure to enter into the orbital cavity just underneath this orbital plate of the frontal bone. The V2, which is the maxillary division, passes through a foramen called foramen rotundum and then enters into the pterygopalatine fossa, while the V3 or the mandibular division passes through the foramen ovale to enter into the infratemporal fossa. Now here you're looking at the right side of the face. The sensory distribution of the face from the trigeminal can be divided into three subregions. So for instance, if we take the tragus as our reference point, and if we draw a line from the tragus to the lateral canthus of the eye, then this region over here above this line would be the area which is innervated by the ophthalmic division of trigeminal nerve. And if you draw a line from the tragus to the lateral angle of mouth, then this region here is the area which is innervated by the maxillary division of trigeminal nerve. And then the region down below over here where the mandible is present or the lower jaw is present, that is going to be innervated mainly by the mandibular division or the V3 division of trigeminal nerve. So the sensory information, uh, and when I say sensory information, I'm referring to the general somatic sensory information, such as the sensory information of pain, touch, vibration, proprioception, two-point discrimination, that information which can be perceived in any part of the body, that information from the face in this region is going to be carried by neurons which run inside the ophthalmic division of trigeminal nerve. And then from this region over here, this is the region which is the distribu this is the region which belongs to the maxillary nerve. So the sensory general somatic information from this region is going to be carried by the neurons which run inside the maxillary division of trigeminal. And then in the lower jaw region, all the sensory general somatic information from the lower jaw would be carried by the neurons which run inside the mandibular or the V3 division of trigeminal nerve. Now that we know a little bit about the course of the trigeminal nerve, uh, let's talk a little bit about the nuclei giving off the sensory and motor neurons which contribute to the trigeminal nerve. Remember we said that we will commence studying each cranial nerve using this table and this pictorial representation of the table over here. So if you look at the trigeminal nerve in this table over here, the table suggests that the trigeminal nerve is a mixed nerve. It has sensory as well as motor components to it. It has one motor nucleus, which is the trigeminal motor nucleus belonging to the special visceral efferent category, and it has three sensory nuclei. The motor nucleus, which is situated in the special visceral efferent column, uh, this will be innervating all the structures which are derived from the second brachial arch. These include the muscles of mastication, stapedius, and some other muscles. The sensory nuclei include the mesencephalic, the main sensory nucleus, and the spinal trigeminal nucleus. These are general somatic afferent nuclei, which are shown in blue over here in this picture. You can see the mesencephalic nucleus in the midbrain region. The main sensory nucleus is bumpy nucleus in the pons region, and the spinal trigeminal nucleus in the metola, extending a little bit down into the spinal cord as well. So all the general somatic sensory information from the face region would be entering into these nuclei over here. Just to reiterate one more time over here, these nuclei are concerned with receiving the general somatic sensory information from the face, and so the special sensory information is not going to enter into these nuclei. The general sensory information refers to the sensory information of pain, touch, vibration, and so on, which can be perceived in any part of the body, whereas the special sensory information refers to the special senses, such as the sensory information of taste, which can only be perceived by the tongue, the sensory information of vision, which can only be perceived by the eyes, and hearing, which can only be perceived by the ears and so on. Right, so we said that there are three sensory nuclei of the trigeminal nerve which all belong to the general somatic afferent category. We can study these nuclei in the bigger context of the three-order neuronal principle of the sensory pathways, which I already have described in my video on the sensory spinal pathways.
So if you remember, we said that most sensory pathways have a first order neuron whose cell body is situated inside the peripheral nervous system, which means inside the spinal nerves, or in this case, it will be the cranial nerve. Then we have got a second order neuron whose cell body is situated inside the central nervous system, inside the brain or inside the spinal cord. And this is the one which decussates or crosses at some point inside the central nervous system. Then there is a third order neuron whose cell body is residing inside the thalamus where all the sensory information gets relayed. The third order neuron then projects that sensory information to the cerebral cortex where the conscious perception of that information begins to happen. The same three order sensory neural pathway system also applies to the trigeminal sensory system as well and the sensory trigeminal nuclei are a part of it. So as part of the sensory trigeminal system, the dendrites of the first order neurons, they bring in the sensory information from the dermatomal distribution of the V1, the ophthalmic division, or the V2, which is the maxillary division, or the V3, which is the mandibular division. Uh, division of the trigeminal nerve. These dendrites, they travel through the ophthalmic, maxillary, or the mandibular divisions of the trigeminal nerve, and they have their cell bodies inside the peripheral ganglion, which is called the trigeminal ganglion. The exons of these first order neurons, they then travel into the pons, which is now a part of the central nervous system, to synapse with the cell bodies of the second order neurons. These are actually the nuclei of the trigeminal nerve, which we were referring to in the table on the cranial nerve nuclei. They span the entire extent of the brain stem. These are divided into a mesencephalic nucleus, which is inside the midbrain mainly. Then there is a main sensory nucleus, which is primarily inside the pons, this bumpy nucleus over here. And then there is a spinal trigeminal nucleus, which spans, ex which spans the entire extent of the medulla oblongata and continues down a little bit into the spinal cord as well. Hence, it's called the sp and hence it is called the spinal trigeminal nucleus. The nuclei are functionally specialized to receive specific types of sensory information. For instance, the first order neurons, which bring in the sensory information of proprioception, doesn't matter which distribution uh, of the trigeminal nerve they are bringing that information from. They could be bringing the proprioceptive information from V1, V2, or V3 distribution of the phase. But if it is a proprioceptive information which is being brought in by the first order neurons, then those first order neurons will bring in that sensory information into the mesencephalic nucleus of the trigeminal terminal nerve. The first order neurons which bring in the sensory information of vibration and two-point discrimination from the face, they synapse with the sensory nucleus of the trigeminal nerve in the pons over here, while the first order neurons which bring in the sensory information of pain and temperature from any part of the face, they will synapse with the cell bodies in the spinal trigeminal nucleus of the trigeminal nerve. The second order neurons, they will then cross over to the opposite side or decussate and then ascend to synapse with the cell bodies of the third order neurons inside the thalamus. The thalamus is the main sensory relay station of our brain. The third order neuronal cell bodies inside the thalamus which receive the sensory information from the face, these are the VPM nuclei. Unlike the VPL nuclei, the ventral postural lateral nuclei which receive the same sensory information from the body from the face below. The third order neurons then project to the primary sensory cortex in the face region just above the lateral sulcus. So if there's a lesion on the right side of the pons, then this could result in a hemisensory loss on the right side of the face as well. Now, since we are above the level of decussation of all the spinal pathways, because we know that the pain temperature pathway, the spinal thalamic pathway has already crossed inside the spinal cord, and we know that the corticospinal tract, which is the motor pathway, along with the dorsal column, which is the sensory pathway, they both cross inside the medulla. So with the lesion inside the pons, we are above the level of decussations of all spinal pathways, and, and therefore the sensory loss in the body and the weakness in the body is going to be on the opposite side, which means with the lesion inside the pons, which affects the trigeminal nuclei, there would be hemisensory loss of the face on the right side, but the sensory loss and the weakness in the body would be on the left side. And this dissociation of the sensory loss and the clinical deficit helps you localize the lesion inside the pons. 
Now, as far as the motor nuclei are concerned, there is only one motor nucleus, which is a special visceral efferent type of a nucleus, and that innervates structures which are derived from the first brachial arch. So here you can see the illustration of the back of the brain. You can see the posterior aspect of the pons over here. The motor nucleus uh, of the trigeminal nerve is situated inside the pons shown over here. This is our special visceral efferent category of the motor nucleus. This motor nucleus contains the cell bodies of the lower motor neurons, which would be traveling inside the trigeminal nerve. The upper motor neurons, which are the corticonuclear pathways for this nucleus, would be traveling from the cerebral cortex, coming down over here, synapsing with the cell bodies of the lower motor neurons inside this special visceral efferent category of nucleus, which is the trigeminal motor nucleus. The lower motor neurons from the trigeminal motor nucleus would then travel through the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve to innervate various effector muscles. Just remember that the trigeminal nerve has three divisions, V1, V2, and V3. V3 is the only division of trigeminal nerve which contains the motor fibers. It contains sensory fibers as well, but the other two divisions, which are V2 and V1, they are purely sensory divisions. There are only sensory neurons running inside them. There are no motor fibers. So the lower motor neurons coming from the trigeminal motor nucleus would would be traveling only through the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve to innervate various effector muscles. Now, the motor structures or the muscles which are innervated by the trigeminal motor neuron would include the muscles of mastication, such as the temporalis muscle, the masseter muscle, and the medial and the lateral pterygoid muscles. The trigeminal nerve also innervates the tensor tympani muscle, which is a small muscle present inside the middle ear cavity and is attached to a little bony ossicle inside the middle ear cavity, which is known as the malleus. One of the important functions of this tensor tympani muscle is that it keeps the movement of the malleus intact and so doesn't allow the malleus to vibrate with a very large amplitude in response to the sound wave. And this actually dampens the sound and preventing the individual from hearing louder than usual. And that is why if there is a lesion of the trigeminal motor nerve or if there is a paralysis of the tensor tympani muscle, then the ossicles such as the malleus would vibrate with a very large amplitude and the individual would be hearing louder than usual, a condition which is known as hyperacusis. Then another muscle which is innervated by the trigeminal motor nerve is the tensor villi palatini muscle, which is one of the muscles of the pellet responsible for elevation of the pellet and several other muscles which are innervated by the trigeminal motor nucleus include the mylohyoid and the anterior belly of the digastric muscle which are muscles contributing to the muscular floor of the oral cavity. Now, so if you understand the course and the innervation of the trigeminal nerve and its nuclei, you'll be able to understand the clinical deficits which could be elicited as a result of the trigeminal nerve palsy. For instance, a person with the trigeminal nerve palsy could have a loss of general sensations from the half of the face on the side of the lesion and including the mucous membranes of the oral and the nasal cavities on that side as well. So if there's a lesion of the trigeminal nerve on the right side, a hemisensory loss on the right side of the face would be expected. Then, then you could actually also find a loss of corneal reflex on that side as well. So what is a corneal reflex? Well, when we do a clinical neurological examination, we, we usually check for the corneal reflex. So what we do is that we take a little cordon swab and touch the side of the sclera. So when we touch the sclera with a cordon swab, the sensory information of the touch or the pain or the irritation is carried by the afferent limb of the corneal reflex, which is the trigeminal nerve, and that information is is carried by the afferent limb of the corneal reflex, which is the ophthalmic division of trigeminal nerve. That information is brought, brought into the central integration center, which in this case would be the pons. And then the pons then generates a motor response, which is carried by the facial nerve to the orbicularis oculi muscle of the eye, causing the eyelids to contract and consequently resulting in the closure of the eyelids. So a lesion in the pons or a lesion involving the trigeminal nerve or the facial nerve would result in a loss of corneal reflex. Another thing which you can see is 
is that there would be flaccid paralysis of the muscles of mastication. And we know that the muscles of mastication include the temporalis, masseter, and the medial and lateral pterygoid muscle. Now, one of the actions of the medial and lateral pterygoid muscle is they cause the jaw to protrude towards the opposite side. Now, in normal case, when the trigeminal nerve is intact on both sides or the trigeminal nerve nuclei are intact on both sides, the medial and lateral pterygoid, they cause the jaw to protrude in the midline. But if, let's say, there's a lesion on the, of the trigeminal nerve on one side, for instance, there's a right trigeminal nerve palsy, then that would result in the unimpeded action of the lateral medial pterygoid of the left side, which caused the jaw to deviate towards the right side. And so the direction of the deviation of the jaw would actually be pointing towards the side of the lesion. So if the jaw is protruded towards the right side, that means that the trigeminal nerve palsy is on the right side. And if the jaw is protruded to the left side, then that means the trigeminal nerve palsy exists on the left side. Then the trigeminal nerve palsy could also result in the paralysis of the tensor tympani muscle. And we said that the tensor tympani muscle was attached to a little ossicle called the malleus inside our middle ear cavity. And a paralysis of the tensor tympani muscle would result in the malleus oscillating with a very large amplitude in response to the sound waves when they hit upon the tympanic membrane. And this would result in the patient hearing louder than usual, a condition which is known as the hyperacusis. These, so these are all the different clinical manifestations which could actually result by a lesion of the trigeminal nerve. So as part of this video, we discussed the trigeminal nerve, its course, its origin from the base of the brain, and its sensory and motor nuclei. We talked about the functions of the sensory and motor nuclei, and, and in that context, tried to understand the clinical deficits which could be elicited as a result of lesion of the trigeminal nerve or its nuclei. So thank you very much for listening to the video. Please do like it and subscribe to the channel. Goodbye for now.